Okay, so let me talk about what's going to happen today. Um, I've got a bit of a lecture, although the first thing I got to do is see how many people want to give talks. Because if enough people want to give talks, maybe I shouldn't give a lecture at all. Because um, there are two days to give your presentation. That's this time and next time. So how many people are ready today? One, two, three. Right. Are there any people online that wish to give a talk today? Right. Well, if there's only three, then I'll just give a normal lecture, and maybe next time, in the next bit of presentations, I'll have to arrange a more complicated point schedule, because I have a feeling I'm going to get 20 people try to give a talk next time, and that's not practical. But, you know, I will cope. Uh, let's see, you've got some online people. Got a good, okay. One online, good. All right. So, let me just get a list on the board. I got Michael. Uh, let's see. Michael. And Steve, I saw. 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 Oh, you're not married Not today. Okay. Who, who is Caitlin today? Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm getting I'm into work. Who else? Uh, okay. What's your name? Alex. Alex? Alejandro. Okay. And who else? Ah, okay. Uh, why can't? Why can't? Right. All right. So can we get like half? Well, in retrospect, in retrospect, I should have done that, but I decided I can't change it five minutes before class. All right, what's the email address to submit homework to 152? Um, it's uh, on the 152 page. Let me just uh, bring it up here. Uh, if you go down here, there you go. Sheenet152 sam at gmail.com. All right. Anyway, so I'll put that in here. And uh, all right. So let me just talk about the uh, chapter for today, which I was good. I'm glad you're here. I was thinking of you a lot for this chapter. This is uh, very much like what you're going through at your company, doing compliance. So um, here's, this was very interesting. I mean, the whole thing, the management part of this stuff is difficult for me because it's alien. So at first it seemed to have no content. And then when I looked at it again, I see that it does, which I guess is how people feel in the field they're not great at. You know, technical part, I understand. It's like mathematics. There's one answer. It's 100% right. In management, it's not that way at all. Um, so anyway, I broke this chapter into three pieces and uh, maybe even four pieces. But anyway, the first two I've read through. So this is the big one. 30% of the whole exam is based on this chapter. And this is really important stuff. Although it is not math and technical, it is about business. And this, I think, is the big awakening that I've seen at all the security conferences over the last couple of years. These security people have realized they are just part of the business, and they shouldn't feel better than business or more pure than business or business should just shut up and listen to them. They're just part of the business like everybody else, and they have to explain why what they're doing helps the business and cooperate with it and not feel all high and mighty and superior. So this is qualitative stuff, and that is because some of the question that came up last week with Alex there are no metrics worth anything in this business. It would be great if this was a science and you could prove that buying a better firewall saves you this much money, but we're nowhere near that. Of course, we already also don't know that buying an ad on TV will sell this much more product or anything else. None of the business is never all that scientific. It's all pretty much judgment calls, trying to guess, predict the future, trying to make deals. It's not science. So we're, we're no worse than any other part of business, but we're not a whole lot better as far as being quantitative and predictable. So um, if the risk management program is a way to make decisions and uh, to create a culture within the company that will lower your degree of risk. And I must say, I'm, the stories I've heard from her ventures and compliance, they really fit in here. Um, so the point is, the most important thing you have to have is support from executive management. And the primary goal you are trying to accomplish is to change the culture of the business so that people think about risk instead of just throwing junk together and hoping somebody else will secure it later, which is the way people tend to start out. And so you have to design a program that will do this, and it's not like one size fits all. You have to adapt it to the company. And the most important consideration is you have to fit into the culture of the company, which is sort of the traditions that the founders have created. And that's the way people expect to work. And you can't just disrupt their workflow and make it all different or they will hate you and resist and it won't work. You have to, this is a lot like trying to get people to like adopt healthier habits and lose weight or something. You can't just tell them to obey something and then jail them if they don't do it. You have to somehow help them see how to fit better habits into what they're living. 
And so anyway, um, so your culture is the main thing. you got your missions, management structure, consider your industry sector and your market conditions and your regulations and all that jazz, and your financial health, of course. One thing I often hear is we're a small business, we have no money at all, we're a nonprofit, NPR got hacked. Um, when they, in 2012, when LulzSec was hacking everybody, they hacked NPR through a SQL injection and defaced a bunch of pages on NPR. And I went and looked at it, and NPR still had the SQL injection open. And I said, I know they've got no money. They don't even know what I'm talking about. So I contacted Jeremiah Grossman, who's running White Hat Security. And I said, dude, would you like to give NPR a hand for free? And he said, sure, and he helped them clean up their stuff because they couldn't afford to pay him, but he's a good guy. And so he helped them clean up their site. And there's a lot of people just don't have enough money to do anything. So you have to lower your expectations and just try to help them a little bit to be a little more safe, given what they can afford. So your main primary goal here, you also, you can't prevent security incidents. There's always going to be some degree of crime, some degree of flaws. You just hopefully lower the probability and lower the harm by preparing for it. So, and hopefully people begin to think about the risk in what they're doing. Don't just collect a bunch of data and throw it just anywhere. Begin to think about do we really need this data? What would happen if I lost it? Uh, stuff like that. So there's a lot of technologies, and this is really what made me cut this chapter into so many pieces, because there's a lot here, and you should know what these are. They're not explained in the book. They assume you already have Security Plus or something, and if you don't, you should Google them and learn about them. So there's access governance and access management, which are similar, um, ways to control who's getting at what and whether they're an administrator or not. Then there's anti-malware and antivirus, pretty much the same thing. Then there's cloud access security brokers, which is what uh, our, my student in compliance really needs. If you are using a lot of cloud services all over the place, Dropbox and GitHub and everything, you really need to have some kind of central portal where you log in that keeps track of whether you're the administrator or not and what you did in one place, not just scattered all over the place. And you've got security testing tools. There are dynamic ones that run an application to see what it does. And there are static ones coming up on a later side. There's file activity monitoring that tells what everybody is doing all the time, every app they launched. And then there's file integrity monitoring that tells you if apps have been changing or parts of the operating system have been changing, like Tripwire, indicating an infection or some kind of unauthorized update or modification of software. And then we talked about firewalls a lot. Firewall is long ago were very simple things to just look at the port numbers. Now firewalls are very smart and they look at the entire content and they can tell BitTorrent and Facebook and the games and everything and block it and restrict it to all kinds of groups and they're connected to Active Directory and they totally understand this group of people should go here and that group of people should go there. And they're really a big, like a Palo Alto firewall is a big complicated beast like a domain controller and just as important to your network. And so here's the difference between access governance and access um, management. I looked it up because I wasn't sure. So access governance is considered stronger than the older access management system. Anyway, um, so then you got forensic tools. We talked a bit about them. You need to have some way to take memory images and hard drive images and live capture forensics where you get things like registry keys and modified files so you can investigate what's happening. You got governance, risk, and compliance systems, which we're going to talk more about later. These are big suites of data to keep track of everything. Um, and there's some examples of that because our college is moving in this direction too. And we've been demonstrating many ways not to do this. There's intrusion detection systems like SNORT and IPS systems um, like other ones, which can be used, SNORT can be used that way too, but it usually isn't, to um, actually block things that... Um, come through your network. And then there's and network access controls are what you use to prevent unauthorized IC devices from connecting to the network. Then phishing prevention, privileged access management systems, keep track of who's using administrators, uh, credentials. The public key infrastructure is the public system of HTTPS certificates that's used to identify things. And you may make your own limited one if you use private certificates. The SIEM systems like Splunk that we're using quite a bit in the other classes I'm teaching this semester, um, this is a central point of security monitoring where all the logs from all the devices go to one place where they can be searched through and you can track down from one place. Somebody came in here, they ran something, this machine got infected, it went over here, they did that. You can you only, you only track that all down if you have a central SIM system. And um, single sign-on systems, yeah, got some. Oh. Yeah, oh, that's fine. Single sign-on systems are crucial, and this is all closely related to the cloud sprawl issue. 
people don't really want to log in once with their password, then they want to work all day. But in fact, they're touching all these different servers and they each have different authentication rules. So you have some system that somehow decides that I know who you are and lets you in all these systems. And that means it's moving some kind of token around, like a Kerberos ticket or something. And if a hacker can steal that, they can often forge it or extract data from it. This is what Mimikatz does. Uh, ben Delphi, I think the uh, New Zealand guy who makes this product, can always figure out ways to defeat Microsoft's implementation of Kerberos in drastic ways. And that's an issue of single sign-on. If you don't make users keep logging on, then there is some kind of ticket flying around that gives them credentials. And if you can steal or forge or crack that ticket, then you can get in. Then there's the static tools. For static security testing, typically works from source code. It runs looks through the source code itself for security problems. So here's governance, risk, and compliance. And this is the strategy to make sure that your company has enterprise risk management and compliance. Uh, in the early days that they had was continuous monitoring, which was continuous compliance monitoring. The only thing they thought about then was making sure that you're not running too many copies of something to violate your software license, or to do something like a port scan or a vuln scan periodically to see if you are running a known vulnerable version of something. But this is the grown up product that developed out of that, where it actually checks for a whole bunch of risks on your network. And, uh, and controls them and commits, submits the reports and has a place you can go to answer the question, has somebody been bringing in devices from home, not putting on their antivirus patches, using their credentials at an unexpected time or in the wrong place or any of the things that might happen. And then you got spam filters, of course. You have third-party risk management systems. While you're putting everything in the cloud and outsourcing everything, you could outsource your risk management which is something you might do if you're a very small company, but then you got user behavioral analytic systems, which I've only heard about for the last two years. These came about entirely as fire cars I can tell because of Snowden. Snowden was a trusted insider and he betrayed the company, leaked out the secrets, causing a monumental disaster. And everybody said, how do we know that that isn't gonna to happen to us? How do we know that our trusted employees are not gonna betray us? And so they will sell you software that attempts to predict that by analyzing their behavior on the network and deciding if they're still loyal. I have no idea if any of this stuff works, but there's a need for it and there's a market for it and people are buying it and using it. I have not seen a test to see if how good it is. Yeah. So that is it tries to predict separate Yes, it tries to predict disloyalty. You would think that you could do it by watching at X amount of time spent at games, showing up late, logging on late at night, uh, too many use of removable devices. You, you might imagine that you could detect some network traces to show that this person is no longer loyal. Seeing a lot of emails to a rival company, it's, you could imagine. And- uh, Is that like a right now, the Lightning guys? What's that? Is this similar to the Lightning guy? You can't have any guys in your A laughing guy? A French knifing guy. A knifing guy. That's a French guy, last couple of days. Yes. Uh, in the police station. Nice. Yes. I don't know anything about this. And I attacked killing uh, four people in the police station. Yes, yeah, somebody. I don't know anything about that. So. No, they, they say that the person should be behavior. Well, I know in America they're trying to pass red flag laws on the idea that people can know that somebody in their family is nuts and you should take away his guns. Um, and that comes from a similar theory. I've heard some psychiatrists come up and say, you know, this really isn't a good idea. And I know the one thing I know, which is a cliche my whole life, every time they have a horrible mass murder, they interview the neighbors and they'll say, gee, he was a nice guy, he seemed just fine, there was no clue. So I, and that's what psychiatrists have said. They said, it is not true that the creepy guy that bothers you is the one that will go nuts. It's the one you're not worried about that will go nuts. I don't know if any of this is true. But, but it's certainly people are buying them and using them, but we don't know how good it is. Um, anyway, then there's uh, unified threat management. These are generalized boxes to try to detect all the threats on a network. Um, these were all, all the rage about eight years ago. I'm not sure how much they're trusted now. VPNs, we know, VPNs had another layer of encryption to what you do, which makes you a lot safer if you're outside traveling using a coffee house network or something. And there's phone scanning and web app scanning that send thousands of requests to a server to get responses to try to decide if it has known vulnerabilities and web filtering to block access to malicious sites and such and access controls. And you can have external monitoring and intelligence services, which we'll talk more later. In fact, one of my students, Archie Holub, is working in threat intelligence all the time. These are people that analyze the bad guys and publish information about the bad guys, what they're doing. And that's a big issue. Yeah. Uh, how trustworthy are VPN systems? 
They, that's a very good question. And the answer is not very. VPN systems, there was a test about a year ago, and they found that 80% of VPNs when used as directed are garbage. Like they don't really encrypt the, the DNS. They're probably better than nothing, but most of them are seriously defective. And even the ones that are not technologically, technically defective, probably mean you're handing your data to some server in like China or Russia. So it is, you have to understand, what VPNs do is stop the people in the coffee house next to you from stealing your data. Well, after that, yes, after that, they don't go, so if your company has a VPN, a concentrator, like a Cisco VPN concentrator, then in fact, it's a lot better, right? Because then it's controlled by your company and you're encrypting it to your company. And it has the desired effect that if you're far away coming in, it's about the same as being at work. And it secures that connection from the coffee house to work. And that's a good thing. I mean, in that respect, it's very good. And if you pay for a service and you trust the company, like a lot, of, a lot of people want to go to Cloudflare and I trust Cloudflare pretty well. I'm really, I know the people at Cloudflare. A lot of people say they're rotten bums. You can't trust them, but I don't feel that way at all. I feel like I trust them probably more than my ISP, more than the college for sure, probably more than Google. They really seem like pretty straight shooters to me. So I wouldn't mind trusting them. But the fact is your data is going to somebody and somebody can see it. <laughs> but, um, that's a, that's a big issue. It certainly doesn't mean you can't be hacked. And it doesn't mean nobody can see what you're doing. It just gives you one layer of defense and some protection. It's a very good question. And it's related to a news item that keeps coming up, which is HT, DNS over HTTPS. This also gives you some protection, but a lot of people are screaming bloody murder and saying it doesn't really protect you very well and it blocks up a lot of monitoring and filtering tools and they're yelling. Yeah. Is that the same as um, like the Defender uh, has a box now? It's like a firewall for your home. Um, is that kind of the same? Well, I don't know the Bitdefender product specifically, but I know a lot of home gateways do offer VPNs. You can put it on your home router if you put on uh, OpenWRT or some other software. Your home router could run a VPN. I mean, instead of just connecting to it, you could connect with a handshake and have an encryption key. And then there'd be an encryption key you typed in at that end and one you typed in at your end that nobody else knows. And then you'd be, if you're traveling, you could VPN to your home and it would be as if you were home. And that would probably be better than being in a coffee house. But then the step from your home to your ISP would not be any more encrypted. So it's, it's a very good point. You, VPNs are fine. Like I say, I got hacked at DEF CON, and if I'd been using a VPN, it wouldn't have happened. So there are some attacks that it protects you from, but nothing's perfect. Yeah. Well, you have a, a VPN software you installed, and you have previously arranged an account on the server. And um, that's how it works. Although you probably set it up with HTTPS or something, which is pretty good. But once you have done it, then but you... Does the coffee house know your keys? No, the coffee house never sees your key. That is the whole point. You have an encryption key on your machine. Everything is sent encrypted. And the only person that has the other copy of the key is the VPN server. So anybody between you and the server cannot read the traffic. Assuming, of course, that they don't make mistakes or make the key too short or anything. But in general, they seem to you know, I've heard that mistake too often. So it pretty much means that nobody can read your data between you and the VPN server. And that, that, that protects the most risky spot, which is the last mile, the last little bit reaching you where you're probably in a shared network or something. That's you don't, you don't pass around the key. Yeah, you don't pass around the key. It's all sent through an encrypted channel. You do a handshake and you have a shared secret is most commonly how it's done. Although there are several different VPN protocols. All right, and so a UBA is a, um, a way to detect insider threats. That's the plan. Looking at patterns of human behavior to decide if these people are dangerous. Um, and I said, one thing, one place where this works is credit cards. The credit card industry in America until about a year ago, their only defense was to notify, sus notice suspicious tractions suspicious transactions at the server side, and they were so good at that, they held the fraud below half a percent by just looking to see if this transaction looked funny compared to your other purchases. If there's suddenly one from China and you're not usually in China, they were very good at that. So in principle, this could be done. I don't know how well it's really done for the product you can afford to buy, but in principle, you can detect funny looking activity, which one of my employees appears to be doing something wrong. So I got some cahoots. And all right, there should be set. All right, 3A1.
Hard to see what that is. A pig shrugging? Not, not too clear. No, not hungry. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll give it a few more seconds. We've got uh, quite a few more people. That's what I thought. Give it another five seconds. I don't see anyone struggling to get in. All right. All right, so which item gives you compliance with regulations? The C is compliance in GRC. All right. Which one will detect insider threats? Or so they would have you believe. User behavior analytics. How about suspicious network activity? intrusion detection all right and which one is vulnerable to pass the hash attacks <laughs> so that's single sign-on the public key infrastructure is not vulnerable to that. Microsoft domains are because of single sign-on. You can, the hash is one of the tokens used and you can copy the hash off the network and reuse it and log in as somebody. So let's see, Carrie and Cap, Carrie might be a real name, I think it is. Cap might be a real name more or less, I don't know. That one might be too. Let's see if I can copy it, oh good. <coughs> if that's a real name, we're fine, my grader will check. Anyway. Um, all right, so let's go back to here and talk about some more of these things. So, all right, so when you're buying stuff, um, if you have risk management, then you can plan things. And the correct thing to do is to identify a specific risk and then buy products that lower your specific risk. Um, if you don't have risk management, then you just make buying decisions for stupid reasons like whatever vendors talk you into or whatever seems to be what other companies are doing. And it's blindingly obvious to me that this is what most companies do, which is not to be surprised. Not to be unexpected, when I tried to send vulnerabilities to all the banks, it was very clear that there was nobody intelligent at the other end in most cases. And they were doing, and it always, you know, I, I watched their security for about 10 years, and it's very obvious that they have no idea what they're doing and they just do whatever the other banks do, which is, by the way, not entirely stupid for a business decision because if you do that, you can't be sued. They'll say, well, I'm as good as the standards in my industry. And that is what you do if you don't know anything. If you don't have any reason to do something else, it frustrated me because I had technical information why they were wrong. But from their business point of view, they probably weren't entirely stupid to say, look, you security people blabble constantly and I could waste all my money buying all the crap you're selling me. It wouldn't do any good. I'll just do what will prevent a lawsuit and keep going. <laughs> and that cynical attitude might have been the logical one. But anyway, um, so you decide how much your risk appetite is. Like say, I figured out years ago when I began teaching hacking, I decided I had a high risk appetite. Because I said, you know, they could fire me and I wouldn't care. And I'm aware that most teachers are not in that position. They have a mortgage and are desperate for this job and everything. So what would happen if I just openly teach hacking and make it public and go give a talk about it at DEF CON? I'll either go down in flames or not. 
and I didn't. And then I discovered this is very common in Silicon Valley. Facebook started it, move fast and break things. Uber was the king of it, just charge in and break the law. Nobody cares. It, the modern world is largely from disruption. And I was before all that, but it's the same logic. You know, what if you just didn't care? You just did whatever the hell you wanted, regardless of the fact that somebody will get mad. This can work. You have to have some idea of what would be too far, but, but you might have success to compensate for all the side effects. Yeah. Does that imply that law is just a cost of doing business? Well, I think law absolutely is just a cost of doing business. And I think everyone in America has learned this. Even when you try to do everything as squeaky clean as you can, somebody will sue you. Like they'll sue you at McDonald's for the coffee being hot. The college will sue you for something like wrongful termination when you really aren't doing anything wrong. You just have, everybody has some legal risk. Now, you could also just be a horrible person killing people, poisoning water and everything, and then you'd have a higher degree of legal risk, and you have to decide for yourself what risks to take, but there is no zero risk option. And I must say, I thought there was, and I got over it. But yeah, but I would certainly, there's some legal risk. There are other risks, like insulting your employees, taking the wrong political position. You know, there are a great many risks. And the point is, you decide what your risk appetite is. And there are some companies that are super risk averse, like the old banks, they would keep using token ring for 20 years because they just don't want to change anything because they just don't want to take any risk. And that's one possibility. But most normal businesses are at huge risk anyway. They're very likely to fail. They're very likely to lose in competition or get bought out. So there's no point pretending that taking other risks is not worth it. A risk that brings you more business is probably worth it, even if it has side effects for most companies. Anyway, so you've got your ability to absorb losses and your legal requirements. And so you can make calculated risks instead of just stupidly unplanned risks where you make decisions of what risks you want to take and what risks you're not going to take. And this is the big thing. Like I say, the, in the old days, the IT security would just say, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. So everybody would just ignore them and do it anyway. And they finally realized that's not helping. What you have to do is have rules that people get along with. And this is why we have problems like we do, like the U.S. government passes laws against marijuana and everybody says, tough, I'm just going to smoke marijuana anyway. And we have a huge fight. You can't really have a law if nobody wants to do it, like the 55 mile an hour speed limit. And if you get too strict about it, they will just sneak more and sneak around you and hate you. So you have to have reasonable rules. You, so your company says, you know, I want to expand to China. You say, oh, you're out of your mind. There's no security there. And they'll have traders on the team and they'll steal everything. You say, yeah, but we can make so much money expanding to China. We have to do it anyway. So I'm doing it, and your job is to somehow lower the risk. And that's what you got to do. I mean, if you need to do something for business reason, then just like your lawyers who would say, gee, that's risky, they say, yeah, it's risky. Now, how about you lower the risk? So that's the issue. And you can only hit the brakes and stop something if you really understand that there's a huge risk that's too big, and then you have to convince them of that. And they have to trust you by you not having become the boy who cried wolf by complaining all the time over little things that really didn't matter. They have to know that when you say you really can't do that, it really means something. So, yeah. So, I mean, we were talking earlier about that. You give that example of a person listening to a manager, maybe listening to all that technical stuff, saying not being able to understand it. Yeah. The spirit on the, you know, Just do whatever the industry standard right. is. Yeah. yeah. Industry standard. Do you think that there are any companies out there, just in your experience, where the technical uh, cybersecurity skill and management skills, public management skills, go together? Oh, sure. Those are the industry leaders like Google and Cloudflare. There are companies, their management is very technical and they work very closely with the technical team and they think of brilliant solutions and they're the industry leaders. I think Cisco too and Microsoft. They're the really mature companies that lead and they go to the corners of the Gartner chart and everything else because they have the best stuff and it's really secure. There's a Splunk, I think, too. There's a bunch of them that really have their act together. But most of them don't really have their act together and they're kind of making it up as they go along and they don't really have the resources to hire the best people, and they're not really organized like they ought to be, and they're struggling. And so they, they do compromises, like imitating people and stuff, you know. That's all. Same as anything else. Yeah, not like everybody's crazy. But most people, um, but security people, tend to become an expert in one little corner, and then expect everybody to care. And they feel very abused when nobody cares about the little thing they know. And management says, yeah, yeah, I know you know everything about encryption, but I don't care. You know, but, 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 these are tough. I'm sorry you spent five years learning this stuff, but I don't care. It's not important to me. They say, but you should care. They say, well, I don't care. And you can just lump it. It's, and they usually have an inflated opinion of the importance of their little thing. 
and it's not all that important to everybody. And that's, you know, it's just like any, there's a little bit of maturity revived. I had to live through all this. I was the guy that learned a few things, went around bothering everybody, and they said, shut up. And I had to realize that they were, you're freely right telling me to just shut up with my problem, although sometimes they weren't. So the stakeholders, you need to explain to stakeholders, you can't just go to them and give them a complicated technical lecture about whatever you learned last week and expect them to care. They don't care. What you have to do is tell them, what does this mean to me? What is risk management? What am I going to have to do about it? And how is that going to benefit? They have to be able to see there's a reason I should put up with your stupid rules and procedures. And now I can't just have everybody logging in as root all the time, even though that's working just fine. I can't just log in and change the code without bothering to put it in the version control system. I like it this way. It's easy. Don't make me do all this stupid bureaucratic work unless you can explain to me why it's beneficial and how I'm going to do it. So, you know, that's an issue. You have to engage people and they have to see what they're doing is benefiting you. Otherwise, you're just an irritating boss, bossing them around, messing up their life, and they'll ignore you. So um, security awareness is the activity of just trying to make everybody aware. One thing people do is like everybody in the company have security plus. Kevin Mitnick is the king of this. He's the world's number one hacker from the 90s. A lot of people are very, very jealous of security. Kevin Mitnick, and they swear and complain about him and put him down a lot in the security hacker community, saying he's not really cutting edge and he's not really that smart and he thinks he's so sharp. But the fact is, he makes a lot of money. He has an agent like a movie star, and people travel far to see him because he's a big celebrity, and he gives security awareness talks, which are things like putting up a Raspberry Pi and, or or uh, whatever that pineapple thing and getting some passwords. And he gets people aware of big security risk issues. And he doesn't pretend to be teaching them cutting edge security techniques. He's doing the mass education where everybody in your company has to go to training to be just become aware of like the top 10 risks and to avoid them. And he's considered quite good at that. So, but risk awareness is a different thing. This is training of upper management, not just everybody. And this is about telling your people in your company how, what they're gonna have to do to make more risk aware decisions. And I saw a chat comment coming in. Security Plus is the only shirt I have. Um, I think Security Plus does expire after three years. Does anybody know? I think, yeah, yeah, yeah I think yeah, all the comp to you, okay, two or three years. It does expire after two or three years. Um, oh, so, I mean, it's still a good thing, even if it expired. It's, you can put it on your resume and say, had it, it expired. But usually what you do is you go on and get something beyond that, like a CISM or CISSP or something. But yeah, it's a good question. But Security Plus is not bad. It shows general security awareness, and that's what a lot of companies want to have. It's probably not going to make you a security professional, but a lot of companies would like to see it. It means you're more aware of security issues. Good. Anyway, so, um, all right, so that's the point of risk awareness. And so if you are a good risk um, management team, then you'll be respected in your company, and now people can treat you as an internal consultant. They can come to you and say, gee, we want to partner with these people and put a bunch of our data over here and put it on their servers. And can you help me do that better? And if you're not a jerk, if you don't just say no all the time, maybe you can help them and partner with them. And now you can prevent disasters. I saw a, a blog from um, H.D. Moore, who wrote Metasploit. And he said, I'm really special in my company. And, but every time my company wants to buy hardware, like a bunch of new routers or something, they ask me and I audit it and I tell them if it's secure enough. And he said, boy, I bet you guys wish you could do that. And you really, really have to be trusted in your company and trusted not only to be competent, but to be reasonable and fast. So you're not slowing them down. And, if, and that would be a goal of a risk anal analysis team to get to the point where people trust you enough that you can actually help them avoid making mistakes. So it's a good thing. Anyway, so the key attributes of your risk consultant is you actually have to listen to people. You have to be able to, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, great. All right, anyway. So, um, you know, your main ability is people skills. That's the thing, this whole chapter, this whole class is pretty much people skills more than technology. And, you know, I, I realized I used to be just a technical nerd and I gradually realized that people skills and management are actually really important. And there is kind of a science to it and you can learn to do it. You don't, I was not born like strong on people skills. I was the typical Asperger's nerd hacking on the computer, can't figure out why everybody hates me. But I got over it to some extent and you can learn to do better. So anyway, here's some risk management frameworks. We're going to have a lot more about these in the next section too, because this is a lot of my course. So that's ISO 27,000. That's the gold standard, international standard, where you have this whole big document. I think it's hundreds of pages long. So you're doing all sorts of compliance tests. And then many different versions of it. 
um, many different parts of it. Then there's the American one, NIST, National Institute of Standards, Special Publication 800. This is the, 837 is the Guide for Risk Management Framework. 839 is Managing Information Risk, doing secure risk audits. Then there's COBIT, RIMS, Facilitated Risk Management Process, and we'll talk more about them next time. Um, so they're gonna keep coming back. All these frameworks are very similar. First, you have to define a scope. You might have a risk management program for the entire company, but it might just be for one business process, one location, or something like that. Then you define your objectives. You define policy to hopefully achieve your objectives. Then you decide how much risk you're gonna put up with. You decide roles and responsibilities so people know where they stand, who's in charge, who's gonna do what. And then you have a life cycle process where you implement controls, you audit to see how well the controls effect are effective, and then you modify the controls as needed. And then you document everything and subject it to management review. They all do these same general things with different detailed ways of doing it. And there are systems you can buy to help control this. There's, I got a list online of the top 10, and here's a few RSA Archer and Logic Manager and Risk Connect. There are things you buy, big pieces of software, just to organize all this. At this college, we use something called Curricunet, which is very, very, very annoying and poorly written, but it is there to provide this management structure where everything is supposed to be in there, all the grades, all the teachers, all the classes, all the programs, all the degrees is all supposed to be in some big system so they can make a report for compliance of here's everything we did and here's a measure of how good it was and here's how we're going to improve our policies to make it better next time. And around here, it's all pretty much complete fake nonsense of people filling out forms they don't understand handy and the other people don't know what they're doing. But that is how it usually starts. And after people get used to it, it may eventually lead to something good. But anyway, so the big issue when you switch to one of these platforms, you're upsetting now everybody who is busy doing their job now has to try to understand these weird new requirements and fill out forms and get logs and collect data for some reason they don't understand. And that's why people skills are your main thing. You have to somehow convince all these people to start doing things right. They've probably gotten used to doing all sorts of horrible things like having five different accounts not even nobody even knowing what they're logging in as logging in and changing things directly not recording what they did uh giving some account to vendors and then forgetting to cancel it when the vendors leave and just all sorts of stupid things are probably going on and you have to somehow wean them off that like convincing someone to stop smoking to get them to stop doing things wrong and start doing things right without rebelling too much so uh your scope might be a whole organization or just part of the business and you've got to consider the internal environment, their mission, their strategies, their financial health. The maturity of your organization is what you're doing here. Your organizations start out at a low level maturity where the original founders have just written a bunch of stuff and put it in the cloud and it's running and customers are coming in and stuff is happening and you're getting buzz because it's good. But there are things that are unprofessional and wrong that need to be cleaned up. That's an immature business and you become mature when you start actually doing things in an organized way and recording what you did and having management that can actually review the logs and decide how to change it. That's how you move from being just sort of a startup with an idea to being a serious company. So here's the link for Security Plus. Yeah, that's good, somebody published it. Good, all right. So anyway, um, you got the external environment, of course, Ex outside your company, laws and regulations and political environments and external threat holders and stakeholders. Um, this is why I know some people are reluctant to work with my new corporation because I have a customer in Saudi Arabia and there are people who have told their employees, you cannot have any business in Saudi Arabia because we are very, very afraid that the Democrats are going to have sanctions against Saudi Arabia and the U S government will block all contracts to Saudi Arabia. And even if that doesn't happen, the information security community is very, very much far on the left. They're all very politically correct. And if, if you are perceived as having done something politically incorrect on Twitter, everybody will scream and yell and boycott you and hate you. And they don't want all that nonsense. So they tell people just stay away from anything politically controversial. And that is a business risk decision. I don't care, so I did it. But other people are not as reckless as me. Anyway, so, um, all right. CompTIA, continuing education program. Good, good for three years. Good, okay, good, good. That's a good discussion about CompTIA going there. Then there's gap analysis. So you examine your process and decide, you take the current state of whatever it is and you compare it to what you want it to be, and that's the gap. And gap analysis is determining the gap. Let's see, it's probably, yeah, good, all right. So, um, all right. So, you, for example, if you have a control process, right now, 
you might have people changing your software and that might be a log of changes and then it might be emails where they ask the manager and a bunch, a bunch of email replies saying, okay, change this, don't change that. And that's your current change management system. So it would be better to actually have a change request procedure, change advisory board, know who's in charge and have a more complete log of what was changed and why it was changed. That's what we'd be moving from just sort of an ad hoc system to a more mature system. Although, of course, even their current state is a lot better than people that just have cowboys logging in as root changing things and nobody even knows what they've done, which is something that, of course, happens in a lower level of maturity. So then you, uh, you, your security manager is probably not ready to know everything, so they have to go outside and get more experience, get more outside support from people with tools, technical things, risk management. So there's a lot of information sources. There are meetings, informal meetings of groups, meetups and such, there are all these organizations like I, ISACA is in San Francisco and uh, Cloud Security Alliance, I've heard of them. There's InfraGuard around here. I haven't heard of all these, but all these people have meetings and, and groups you can talk to in online forums. Yeah. Uh, the ISO and the IFC, um, do, you, do you recommend it or they're just like extra? Well, ISC squared. Um, well, I know ISACA has regular meetings in San Francisco and um, I think they made this or CISM, ISC squared, CISSP, they're widely respected. Um, I don't know much about their local meetings. I've been to a few of them. I haven't been to those meetings. I've been to other ones. I go to the big hacker cons like DEF CON and such. And I went to um, OWASP, which is web application. But there's many, many groups at all different levels. These are the ones specifically aimed at management. So I don't go to them that much. But I might go to the more. I, I'm getting more interested in management. So then there's um, published practices from all these organizations, of course. And there's security industry news. There's a bunch of older ones. I like Paul's Security Weekly. I highly recommend it. It's a podcast. It's very informative. And just listening to the way these guys talk, I've gotten a lot more clue what the managers really do at the huge companies. Because I never worked at huge companies. I worked at small businesses and then in education. That's why I keep telling students to go talk to Richard Wu if you want to get a job. Because he knows how to negotiate with these corporate people and get a good pay. And I really don't know how to do that. I never did that. And that's what these guys are doing. They're managing huge international companies and buying multi-million dollar products and negotiating deals with these people and using tools that somehow limit the risk all over the place. And it's very interesting. And I only know it at a theoretical level. And I don't suppose I ever will know it beyond that. But anyway, it's um so then there's research organizations you hear out there like Pricewaterhouse Cooper and Ernst and Young and Semantic has a threat report that we report information about these risks. And there's advisory like Gartner is the most famous one with their quadrant where they rate how good a company is by their completeness of vision and ability to execute, which is what they think is how much do you have good ideas and how much do you actually make good products? And a few companies like Cisco and Palo Alto are always way up there where they should be. And everybody else is kind of in the middle and it, it helps, you know, they, this is a lot of people then scream bloody murder and say their rating is inaccurate and unfair. And that they would say, even if it was right, I don't know how good it is, but it certainly is a good idea. If you could rate a whole company and say, look, do these guys have their act together? Like Steve was asking, do they really have everybody working together to make good stuff? Or are they a bunch of idiots making junk? Because both of those certainly happen. Yeah. Oh, it could be anything. It could be that they're going broke. It could be that their fundamental idea is stupid. It could be that they don't have enough technical skill to make their product work very well. It could be any of a lot of things. Could be that the, uh, for example, Uber. Uber was highly rated and now they appear to be going broke because their fundamental founder was just kind of insane and crazy and they were never able to fix the culture. He started a culture just barging into towns, breaking all the rules, selling the product at a loss and getting a lot of buzz and they're still losing money and the, the in investors are beginning to get tired of funding it all. So, you know, that's, there's many things that can go wrong. Like I say, most businesses are going to fail. That's why telling them they have to like buy a new firewall, it's very likely not the most important risk. <laughs> the most important risk is their whole business concept is not going to make it. And then no firewall is going to save them. <laughs> anyway, um, then there's consulting firms, of course, trainings and books. I've heard of this first time I took a look at it, the in cybersecurity canon, a list of all the recommended books. I thought this was very interesting. I've only read a few of these. So I put it here. This is from Palo Alto. I see quite a few of my textbooks in here, but a bunch of books I haven't read, so I'll probably read some more of these. That looks pretty good. Yeah. Going back to that, do you think intellectual property is also a very, should be um, highly safe or not really? 
it's a huge problem, intellectual property. The problem with intellectual property, you can some intellectual property like your proprietary research development stuff, people keep secret, and they are relatively successful at keeping it from everyone except China. China just steals everything. Right. Um, then there is like um, stuff like movies and music, where you have a really terrible problem because you really want to give it to a million customers, but you want to somehow stop the customers from copying it, and that seems to be almost impossible. All the efforts to thread that needle have pretty much crashed and burned to where most people are now selling unprotected stuff because all the attempts to predict copying just created a disaster. That's, that's a tougher one. But protecting your internal property so your competitors don't steal is a big deal. However, there are corporate spies and moles and insider threats and bribes. Your competitors often do steal it. That happens a lot. And foreign countries are just rampaging through stealing everything. So... Um, but of course, you probably don't care if China steals it, right? If you're, if, you're, if you're selling like soft drink and you're not planning to expand to China, then if China steals it and copies it, that doesn't hurt you. Your real threat is your competitor here stealing it. They're also trying to steal it. And they might get it, but you might be able to stop them because they're probably not as powerful. Right, because that was one of the big problems with um, having an invasion here and then trying to globally expand and then kind of like, you know, very out of copy. This is a huge issue, I know. And if you want to get people to care about your innovation, you have to tell them about it. So you have to expose it to some degree of theft. That's why one thing, I, when I was a research scientist, I worked at a medical clinic in San Francisco and a bunch of people in my clinic wouldn't tell anybody what they were doing because someone will steal my ideas. And I always just told everybody, I said, that's fine, I got more ideas, I don't care. But there's just different philosophies. I didn't feel like keeping anything secret. I just wanted everybody to hear about it so we could all do something. And other people felt like they lock their idea up and they actually told their students to lie to everybody about what they were doing so no one steal their super idea. And you know, it's, it's just different cultures. Yeah, like, uh, okay, I was going to talk about the, like staff authorization, but who has access to what type of information? Yeah, yeah, you can try to control it. And that's what the military does, of course. They have all these roles and controls to try to limit the access that the data doesn't leak out. And it's important that it doesn't, but as we can all see, they are spectacularly ineffective. The most critical data leaks out all over the place. It is, it's pretty tough. And then there's Trump, you know, paying the hookers not to expose him. And that didn't work. I mean, trying to hold secrets in is really hard. And I don't know any of any good solution, but a lot of the world does depend on trying to keep secrets in. So, so anyway, then there's, of course, all the conferences like RSA and Black Hat and DEF CON and just all over the place. There's the highly management types like RSA and Black Hat, and then there's hacker types like DEF CON and all the ones in between like B-sides. These are all good places to go. You have to do something to learn whatever is of interest to you. And if you're a high corporate management type, then things like Paul Security Weekly and RSA are the ticket. If you're just a hacker in your garage building stuff, then DEF CON is the thing. And you've got to find whatever gives you good information for wherever you're, you want to learn. And then there's the security intelligence services that I was talking about. These are ones who tell you about what the bad guys are doing and what you should worry about. If I subscribe to some of the FBI ones that you get from InfraGuard and um, the High Tech Crime Investigators Alliance. And uh, you can also subscribe to any of these. Here's like the top 10 uh, X-Force Exchange and so on. These are services you subscribe to that give you alerts. And some of them are machine readable. So you feed them right into your uh, enterprise IDS or something to detect these signatures. And I know this is what um, Archie Mpola, one of my students, is doing. Now he works at Cisco, and his Twitter feed every day is like another three or four analyses of threat actors. And he has on pastebin a list of indicators of compromise and tools, techniques, and procedures of these threats. He's taking honeypots or something and finding attacks and analyzing them and publishing results. So basically, he looks to me like he's contributing to one of these things. Yeah. Yeah, those conferences, do you think there's an oversaturation of? Faulty products. Oh, faulty products. Oh, well, well, yeah. The, if you go to the conferences that are like more vendor oriented, like RSA, there is like a giant Moscone Center full of people trying to sell you stuff. And of course, most of that is garbage. It is snake oil. It's oversold. They used to have like women models in bikinis posing in front of it to hoodwink you into buying it. And finally, that became too politically incorrect. But that showed how sleazy they are. They were trying to trick you into paying a lot of money for junk. And I'm sure that's still the case. And that most of them, that's why, you know, most of them are some new company that just came up. And probably they'll be gone next year. So if you buy that junk, you'll be sorry. That's why, you know, they always used to say nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Because IBM will be there in 10 years still supporting it. It might not be the best. It might not be the cheapest. 
but you won't get fired. They will still be there and they will take care of you. That was their big product. They would take care of middle managers. They would answer the phone. They would send a tech to your place. They would take care of you so you wouldn't get fired because they know that's their business. Is, and that's, but you have all these, yeah, absolutely. There's a bunch of people selling stuff and probably most of it's going to be gone. Yeah, especially the red flag when people say, um, this is a, a artificial intelligence yeah, AI is the, well. AI is the new buzzword. I know at uh, at Black Hat there was the big buzz because some guys had claimed to be breaking RSA encryption with their quasi prime numbers and AI solution based on the harmony of the spheres in music and stuff. It was basically religion, and they got mocked and booed out, and their video taken down and humiliated greatly. They were they were they were outside the usual level of snake oil and bullshit. There's a lot of snake oil and bullshit. <laughs> Even from the real vendors, they will exact like army recruiters. They will exaggerate the benefits and try to lie about the risks to get you to buy. But there's a limit to what the community will put up with. You can be so sleazy that they actually kick you out. But most of them are like people selling cars. They're lying, but only to a certain point. This is like this is what I think on wrong with Trump. He, nobody's keeping him close enough to the acceptable amount of lying. Now he's way over to the ridiculous amount of lying where nobody can make excuses for it. Anyway, so, um, all right, I got a few cahoots about that. And then we'll take a break and do some of these student presentations. So we're 3A2, all right. So six months presenting the stuff following You have six months, they're still after you? Yeah, it took about four and a half, five, six months. Yeah. Yeah, if you let them scan your card, they will contact you and offer you lobster dinners and stuff to try to get you to buy their stuff. One of my students signed me up for one of those things and they kicked me to a lobster dinner where they tried to sell me a $30,000 firewall. And they promised to kick back like $10,000 to me if I just talked people into buying it. It was blatant fraud and I was not happy. Didn't really care much about the lobster either, anyway. So. And he probably lied about me to get me in. They wouldn't want anybody in there unless they actually thought that you had the ability to trade your company to buy a $30,000 firewall, which I totally did not, but probably some the student probably said I did. <laughs> it was an interesting experience, but I didn't buy their firewall. As far as I can tell, that company is totally gone. That was top layer firewall. I never heard of them again. They had a retired U.S. general pushing their product. And I was sitting there thinking, what does this guy know? And I think the answer is no. They just paid him to promote this junk. And then they offered us kickbacks to buy this junk. And mysteriously, next year, they were gone. So anyway. Yeah, nobody. There was no, the technical part made no sense at all. <laughs> Why their firewall is better than the other firewalls. Although I was pretty offended and not listening too closely by that point. <laughs> anyway. So what service does Kevin Mitnick provide? He does security awareness. I see a chat message. Cyrus the virus. Okay, good. All right. Anyway, I guess that's somebody's username is Cyrus the virus. Right. It's security awareness is his thing. Anyway, so uh, the primary purpose of risk management. To improve the business, preventing risky activities is what people used to say. This was Dr. No, where you just say, no, you can't do things. That doesn't actually do any good. You have to improve the business. That's the goal. Just like everybody who's part of the business, you're no different than any of them. You are trying to make it so they can make more products, make good products, sell them, make happy customers. That's what you want. So, 
Yeah, the green, yeah, the popular answer. This, by the way, is what the whole industry would have said five years ago. We're here to like be the last bulwark stopping the collapse of civilization by making people get a better firewall until we finally realized that management who was ignoring us all these years wasn't entirely wrong. And it's not that simple. It's not that you have to obey our rules or the rule will end. It's more like we just have a concern which should be balanced with all the other concerns in the way that makes the business work best. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. So which process requires relationships of trust? Okay, risk consulting. The people in your company will not consult with you unless they trust you. All right. And what's the most important consideration when choosing a GRC platform? Most important thing in the same spirit is it has to fit into the culture so it doesn't mess up people's workflow too much or it will more accept. So anyway, that's the big lesson here. So I got cap twice, so that's six. And I have the person with sell twice, and I got this. Is that Caitlin? It could be. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I'll assume it's Caitlin until proven otherwise. Well, it doesn't look very much like one of yours. Okay, good. All right. All right. Anyway, this is a okay. So I think I'll uh, stop the share for now, or um, and uh, actually I leave the share going because we're gonna have student presentations and they might want that recorded. But I'm gonna oh, end so this I'll video. Stop it and start a new session for yeah, yeah. I'm gonna end this video. I'm gonna take a ten minute break. We'll pick yeah. up, come back at seven twenty, and we'll do some student presentations.